So welcome to my little Minecraft office, which is far nicer than my actual physical office. And I haven't seen my actual physical office in four months. Um, I'll also point out I have better hair in Minecraft than actually in real life because I had a clipper accident, if you were wondering about the shaved head in real life. So this talk is going to be about um, the logic that's implemented in a part of the Minecraft game. I'm assuming everybody at least vaguely knows what Minecraft is. Um, and some interesting aspects about it that haven't been um, emphasized, probably just because people don't care, but hopefully we're all logicians and nerdy, so we'll care. Um, and I'm going to work through, and basically the, the main result of this is going to be an expressive completeness result for the logical system in Minecraft. Um, so I'll, ex I'll explain all this from the very, very beginning for people who haven't Minecrafted before. If you played a lot of Minecraft, a lot of the introductory stuff is going to be very basic for you and you're just going to have to suffer through it. Um, I will also point out that if you're the sort of person who occasionally has the logic should be serious and shouldn't be fun and we're having too much fun reaction, this is probably not the talk for you. You might just want to quietly click off and go, go do something else. Um, but there actually is some serious stuff here and I'll come to some of that stuff. Um, and in particular, some interesting connections to some work on many valued logic done by um, Wansing and Shramko. And I'll come, I'll touch on that towards the end. Um, but most of the talk is just going to be sort of just what's inherently interesting about the logic of Minecraft. So um, that's what we're going to do. It's going to be very fun. Ooh, look, I can look at you real close up. Oh, now you can see inside me. Okay. So let's get started. I'm going to change the view so that um, it's a little more natural. So sort of this first person view. So the first thing I want to point out is what we're going to be talking about. So Minecraft is basically this game with blocks, right? You can lay down blocks, you can destroy blocks. Um, many people play in what's called survival mode and there would be trees and mountains and monsters attacking you to make it all very complicated. Um, but this is actually a um, creative world. So I've set it so there are no monsters, nothing to distract us. It's just the machines that we're going to build. Um, to sort of implement the logic um, of Minecraft and see some interesting things. And the machines are all going to be built in this subsystem of Minecraft elements called redstone. And I've got many of the redstone components here, so I'll walk through a few of them. So this is redstone dust, right? And you can actually connect up bits of redstone dust to form redstone wires that will carry current. Um, that's actually redstone dust turns out to be a lot more complicated than you might think. And we'll come to those complexities in a few moments. Another element is this is one of the main sort of constant power sources in redstone and it's a redstone torch. And you can, for example, connect up redstone dust, oh, well, redstone dust to a redstone torch. And notice this torch is powering that, um, little wire there. Um, redstone torches do a lot of other things. They're very weird, and we're going to make take advantage of that as we go through, but that'll be enough for just a moment. Two of the things that are going to be very important in the talk are these two sort of certs, um, basic primitive circuits. This one that sort of has the triangle of red things on it is known as a comparator. Um, we'll talk about what that does, and this one is known as a repeater. It has two, and that actually has four different settings. And this has two different settings, and we'll come to those settings later on. But basically, these take um, up to three inputs, right? So they're oriented. It can take what I'll call the main input, which comes in from what we'll think of as the back here. And then it can take two other inputs from the sides. And then it'll output a current or not, depending on what the inputs are, out the front, right? So if we wanted, we could connect redstone dust to each side. These three... The two sides in the back are inputs, output there. And similarly, the repeater computes a different function, and we'll talk about that. I've got machines set up to illustrate these. The repeater also has two inputs and an output. Sorry, three inputs and an output. Um, and we'll talk about what these do, but again, this is oriented. The output always comes out that way, near, you know, outside with these two bars closest to the edge and the inputs are the other three sides. And we're mostly gonna be looking at a, un a unary version of, of both of these actually, where we just have the single input coming in from the back and the single output coming from the front. 
Some other things that we're going to use. Um, this is a lever. Um, so I'll just put some redstone dust there. If we turn, flip the lever, notice it activates the dust. If we flip it back, it deactivates, right? So it just sends a charge if it's on, sends a you know, no charge or what you might think of as a zero charge if it's off. Um, this we'll use in one of the machines we're going to talk about. This is a button that sends, instead of just being on and off, you press it and it's going to send a pulse. So if you want to get an idea what this does, you press it, it'll activate just for about a second and then it'll turn off. And if you want more charge, you have to hit it again. Okay. This is a redstone lamp and we're going to use this just basically all I'm going to use this for is in some displays so we can easily read what kind of output is coming out of the circuits that, I'm gonna, that I've built. Um, and basically the idea is if we stick some sort of power source next um, that activates it, it will light up. Right, and we're going to use that just as a, as a way to build displays. Um, we actually, it turned out, didn't end up using it, but I left it here um, just because that, you know, four and four, it made it look nice and pretty and symmetrical. This is a redstone block. It's just another, um, basically a block that you can build by combining a bunch of these little bits of dust. And it's also a constant power source, but we're actually always going to use torches for our power sources. But there are lots of, the reason redstone is interesting for people who are actually playing the game in Minecraft is there are all sorts of other machines that operate on the signals that get pat carried by these mindstone, sorry, redstone components. So for example, this is a dropper, I believe. I always get the dropper and the dispenser mixed up. Um, and basically, if you put a power source next to this, it will spit out, if you look, it's got a, a inventory and it will spit out one of whatever's in there. This basically, this one does the same thing, put a power source and it spits something out. Um, these are pistons. If you power them, they'll push things upwards. This is a regular piston. So when it, if you push something up, if the piston came down, it would stay there. This is what's called a sticky piston. You'll notice it's green. And it, if you push a block up and then deactivated it, it would pull whatever it's pushed back down. The green bit's meant to be like sticky. Um, this is a block of TNT that if you activate with a power source will explode and destroy lots of blocks. I'm not going to stick a torch next to that for obvious reasons. This is another power source called a um, pressure plate. If you stand on it or items get put on it, um, it will detect that and send out a current. So if we put a bit of redstone dust here, um, the pressure plate picks up that I'm on it and sends power. Notice that's a trap door that opens if it gets power and it's currently getting power from the pressure plate because I'm standing on it. But if I step off of it, no power. Um, there are other interesting things like um, chests and um, these things over here that, if, that have inventories. And if, they, if some things like chests have inventories, you can connect up a circuit that will activate if there are enough items in the chest and won't activate if there aren't enough. Also, doors can be activated by redstone. Um, this is a, mu a music box, which will play a note. I've gotten the music turned off, so you won't be able to hear it, but you'll be able to see the, um, the animation that goes with it. It'll play a note when it's activated, and you can actually set this to different notes. And then this is a solar panel that, um, as you'll notice throughout the talk, I've put lots of lights around, so this won't be an issue for us. But this detects whether it's day or night, and the Minecraft world will slowly shift from day to night. And this will send out a, a positive signal if it's daytime, but if it were nighttime right now and the sky was dark, there would be no charge on that wire. So that's the basic. We're not going to use any of these components. I just wanted, for those of you who haven't played Minecraft, to give you a very, very quick feel for why the, you know, this stuff is not in the game because people want to do 16 valued logic, right? This stuff is in the game because they want to connect various kinds of simple circuits to these machines and then actually build things that do cool stuff, right? Open it, you know, big doors that open or all, all sorts of fun stuff you can build in Minecraft. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to fly up high. Cool thing about creative is you can fly. And this is all of what we're going to go through. And notice that side goes pretty far off. Um, the first bit is this here. And this is just thinking about redstone as a two-valued logic, where we think of the circuits as on or off. Um, and it's, all of this is very well known. I'm just going to show you how to build a NOT gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, et cetera, et cetera, a simple little memory circuit, and show you that 
Minecraft is functionally complete for two-valued classical logic, right? That's well known. Much is made of this online, Minecraft and education for teaching basic two-valued propositional logic. Nothing exciting there. But then we're actually going to go on to notice that the Minecraft circuitry is actually 16-valued. So then all of this is going to be sort of set up. I'm going to build some basic circuits that um, are going to be useful in what we're going to do, but they're just basic circuits. They're sort of not different kinds of nots and ands and ors and addition and subtraction machines and things like that. Then this branch over here where we get some of these monster big things are where I'm actually going to do the expressive completeness result and a few other interesting things to show that Minecraft is in fact functionally complete with respect to the 16 valued logic that's inherent in the circuitry. Um, so we got a lot to, to do. So I'm going to get going with that. Um, now, a few quick things. Um, in terms of how I've built these circuits, this will especially be interesting for people who've played Minecraft and may be wondering why I build things one way rather than another, is the first rule is I'm going to use as few components as possible, okay? And by that, I mean as few different kinds of components. In fact, as you saw from that big spread, there are all sorts of Minecraft things we can use, but for the most part, we're just going to use comparators, torches, and redstone dust, um, and then lights for the displays. Um, and that's just to, sh to kind of try to get a minimal set of operators within the Minecraft redstone circuitry that is, in fact, expressively complete for the 16-valued logic. The second thing is that when I build these circuits, they're going to be oriented. What do I mean by that? Well, you can sort of see this here. This, I'll, I'll explain all this in detail when we get to it. All of this stuff here with all these switches is just the input con console for different levels of input. And so the input goes in this direction. Blue represents the, the final input, what's going into the circuit. This is actually the entire circuit for this particular example. Orange is the output, right? So this circuit takes an input here that gets generated by all this mess and spits out an output there. And then this whole thing is just going to be a nice display to register that I've built to register what the output is. But you'll notice this circuit basically starts at that end and ends at that end, right? The input comes in and it's sort of roughly linear and the output is at this end. And that's all, all I mean by oriented, right? Is that um, I'm going to try to have the input, if you look at it from sort of this direction, for the most part, inputs are going to be at, at the bottom closest to you, outputs are going to be at the top farthest away. Um, there's one case towards the end where I don't follow that rule, strictly speaking, but it just makes it easier, you know, when we fly up, to try to see what's going on, it's gonna make it much easier to understand what the circuits are doing. Um, rule three is that circuits are gonna be as flat as possible, right? Because as you can already see, um, Minecraft is three-dimensional. You can build up as well as across and down, right? And I've taken advantage of that in our displays, right? These tall towers that I will explain when we get to them. But when I'm actually building the circuits, I'm going to keep them as flat as possible. They're not going to be able to be perfectly 2D flat. I'm going to have to do a little bit of up and down, and we'll see why that is in a few minutes. But again, this is just so we can sort of fly over it and really clearly see what's going on. Okay. Um, and finally, circuits are going to, for, for the most part, be as conceptually simple as possible. I'm not going for super cleverness here right? They're, sim they're clever, really tricky ways you can build some of these circuits, but they often take a while to figure out why they work, right? If you go onto YouTube and look up redstone videos and, and you know, these guys who specialize in redstone builds within Minecraft, there are all sorts of like really tricky stuff you can do and um, make, make circuits that are in, you know, in a much smaller space and, and work in really clever, tricky ways. But it often, like I said, takes a while to see why those circuits work. And I want, my point is to actually sort of explain what's going on here. So I want to make the circuits as conceptually simple as possible. So we can just sort of walk through them and understand what's going on. This is an ongoing project. So you'll see I have space for seven more, three more rules um, that I haven't decided on yet because this is not finished, but it's finished for this particular presentation today. And then the final rule is I'm just going to make the circuits as compact and elegant as, um, as possible. Otherwise, in keeping with the other rules I talked about. So that's a little bit of just guidance. So let's go ahead and look at some basic Boolean two-valued circuits. So the first thing we need is we want a NOT gate. And interestingly, the redstone torch 
works as a not gate. Um, so the torch passes on current. And by the way, from here on, we're almost always going to have torches attached to the side of a brick rather than attached to the ground, right? To the top of that brick that's, that's the ground um, because we're going to use them in this way. So the redstone torch passes on a current to this little bit of redstone dust, which is currently powering this light, right? So the redstone torch is on, current gets passed to the, this block, which then gets passed to the light, the light is on. But the interesting thing about a redstone torch is if the block it is attached to is powered, then the redstone torch will turn off, right? This redstone torch will only be lit if there's no power coming into this block. So basically what that gives us is a simple little knot gate. If I turn on the switch, power goes to the block, the power in the block, now this block is powered, which turns off the redstone torch. If I turn the power back off here, no more power into the block, the torch turns back on, and we've got our knot gate, right? If I send power in, no light. If I send, don't send power in, the light is on. Okay, so far so good. Like I said, this section here, nothing original at all here. All right, binary OR gate. All right, so this is our OR gate. Notice if neither of these is on, the light is off. We turn it on, then the light is on. We turn this one on, the light is on. And if we turn both of them on, the light is on. So it's an inclusive OR. Um, one thing I should point out about this, you'll notice, is that this redstone dust is not directional. Right, so notice the idea here, the reason this OR gate is lit is because this switch is on, powers that dust, powers that dust, powers that dust, turns the light on. But notice the signal also goes back to this switch, doesn't hurt anything, um, but this, this is powered not because anything's happening with this switch, but just because of the current that's coming out of this switch backtracks to there. Doesn't hurt anything, the, sw the, the circuit works. So that's a basic OR. All right, we can also get an and, right? Um, and I'm gonna go through them all. We don't need them all for expressive completeness, but it's nice to just see them. It'll introduce us to the basic operations. And for and, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. We've just done the Morgans, right? There's basically the or gate that we had in the previous example, right? Just that little upside down T-shaped redstone dust. But I've stuck our redstone torch not gate onto each of the inputs. And then I've stuck another redstone torch not gate, you know, taken the output of the ore and then plugged it into the brick, which is then connected to the redstone torch, which if that were on, it would activate that dust and turn on the light. So we've really just used the De Morgan law to combine the ore and not to get an and, and it behaves exactly how we would expect. If we turn this one on, right? Notice what happens. I won't fly. Is if we turn this one on, it turns this torch off. But that torch is still on because we don't have any, any current there. So we still get power through the OR gate, which then, because that power activates this brick, no power comes through the torch. Likewise, symmetrically, if we did that one, same thing happens, but on the other side. But if we activate both of these, then we have power to both inputs, powers both of these bricks, which then means these torches are off. So the OR gate is not activated. It does not charge this brick, which means that torch will turn on and we get our positive output and the light turns on. So that's our AND gate. None of these are gonna be too surprising. We can build a NAND gate. I'm not gonna, this is conceptually the same. We just, you know, it's, it's the AND gate, except that we left off the negation at the end, right? So we've got NOT, NOT, and then an OR, right? So that gives us our NAND gate. Notice if we turn one of them on, everything it's lit. If, if both are off, it's lit. If that one's on, it's lit. But it's not the case basically that A and B, if we turn both on, the light goes off. Exactly what we would expect. Um, the NOR gate, again, same, same thing conceptually, although here we don't have the negations down on the inputs. We first do OR, then we negate it, right? It's not the case that A or B, right? Neither A nor B, right? And again, right, if both of them are off, it's lit. But if we light up one or both, it's not lit, okay? Nothing too surprising here. Actually, in addition, what we want, and we're actually gonna use this one later on, 
this is why I included it, is an XOR gate. Okay, so XOR is um, just exclusive OR. Um, it's also the negation of the, of the material by conditional, if you prefer thinking of it that way. Here, because we're going to use this, and we're going to use it a bunch of times, I actually, and this is not a design of mine, it's a slight modification of a design I found online, and it's pretty common, does use a little bit of redstone trickery, right? So we've got two different torches that are going to be governed by that, in, whether or not they're on is going to be governed by that input, and whether this brick is powered. One goes all the way around to there. The other one, that torch and that torch determine whether this is lit. I'm not going to go through all the reasoning of this, but it works. Um, and again, hopefully you now have access to the world download. So if we light up one of these, we get a light. If we light up the other one, we also get a light. But if both are off, no light. And if both are on, no light. So it's exactly exclusive. Or... Um, so far, so good. Um, so that, by the way, notice we already had this way back down there with um, either NAND or NOR. That's enough to show that with regard to two-value classical logic, redstone is functionally complete with one little detail that I'll get to in a second, right? Because we know if we can get NOR or if we can get not NAND, then we can string those together and compute any binary, um, sorry, any two-valued truth value. Right, that's a you know standard result. I'm sure everybody in the room has seen at some point or another, probably. Um, the one detail I'll actually skip ahead is because we're actually building these physically. Um, for that argument to work in Minecraft, we need to know that we can cross circuits without them interfering with each other. But that's pretty simple for the binary case. For the classical case, we just do you do this over under construction. So this is our input that goes to that light. This is our input that goes to that light. Notice this just goes down a level. This goes up a level and everything works fine, right? This on, off, but turn that one on. Now that's on, notice no interference. Turn that on, it's on. Turn that off, it's now back off, right? Um, and this is enough because, um, you know, we know we can spread these out every, I mean, you know, you, I could cite the result that every graph is embeddable in um, three space, so you know, um, th this is enough. So that's, that we actually need for practical reasons for expressive completeness for classical logic. But another claim that's often made is that redstone circuitry is Turing complete. Now, in some strict logic textbook sense, it's of course not, because you're never going to have infinite memory. You're never going to have anything equivalent to an infinite tape. But if in the slightly attenuated sense that's often used in these discussions when you're looking at actual machines, where we just say, okay, we've got, you know, we've got a bunch of memory and we can always add to it. Um, redstone circuitry is Turing complete. And here's a way to see that. Here's a, we just need to show that we can build memory machines, um, little memory circuits. And this is a memory circuit. What you'll notice here is we've got a feedback loop between two torches, okay? If this torch is on, it will light up the light, but it will also power this brick, which will guarantee this torch is off, which will guarantee no circuit, no power comes in here, which means that torch can stay on, right? Likewise, if this torch were on, we would have power going through this circuit, which would power that brick, which would then turn that redstone torch off, which would mean no, cir no power would be going through this circuit, the light would turn off, and this brick would be pow would not be powered, so that torch would stay on, right? So either this is the way it is right now with this torch on and this torch off is stable, but the opposite is also stable as well. And then what we see is you can, um, so right now it's registering one, right? It's registering on. Um, notice I can hit this and I can just keep hitting this and nothing happens, right? I can keep sending the one signal and the memory just stays in, in the state one. But if I instead sent a signal down here, it'll flip that to the other stable configuration where this torch is on and that torch is off. And notice now additional in zero inputs and also notice the light is off. And, you know, it can keep getting zero inputs and that's not going to change it. But the minute it gets a one input, it flips to the other stable configuration and the light is on. And of course, instead of a light, we could have a circuit, you know, a, a line of circuitry running out of that to do something, right? So this is a little simple binary memory latch, right? That just flips back back and forth between one, right? It stays on one, 
no matter how many times we click that, but then if we click that, it'll go to zero. And of course you could have other kinds of input setups, right? It's, it's very flexible, but that just sort of um, illustrates the idea behind the claim that Minecraft um, redstone circuitry is Turing complete because you could build as many of these little memory, um, you know, one bit memory circuits as you wanted and have arbitrarily large finite memory, right? And that plus the functional completeness will give you Turing completeness. So that's all the well-known stuff about the um, binary case. So let's go on to actually some interesting new stuff. All right. Sorry, I have notes here, so I wanna make sure. Ah, so the first thing I wanna note is that the, the actual charge that runs through redstone circuitry, right? So it runs through these redstone wires, for example, this, this circuit here, it's actually not just on off one zero. This is the key to everything I'm gonna do for the rest of this talk. Instead, right, the charge varies from a charge of zero to 15, right? So let's flip this switch just as an example. So this, this switch will always output a charge of 15, okay? But one interesting thing about redstone wires is that as you move from one patch of redstone dust to the next, you lose one level of, vol of voltage or power, right? So if this has a charge of 15, then this next redstone dust patch has a charge of 14. This has a charge of 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So right now, this bit of redstone dust is just charged to level one, okay? And if we'd done one more consecutive redstone patch, that wouldn't have been charged, have any charge at all, right? The charge would peter out, okay. And that's how, because we're gonna use this input setup a lot with all these switches. Notice if instead of one, I were to switch the switch for 12, well, remember the switch always outputs 15. So that means this has a charge of 15, that has a charge of 14, that has a charge of 13. So this final one, remember I said we were gonna label the, the actual input to our circuit in blue, right? Has a charge of 12, okay? So this circuit, it's, in, it's getting a value of 12 as input, right? This little comparator here. And we'll talk about the comparator in a minute. So that's one of the interesting things about redstone circuitry is it actually, the, the charge comes in 16 different values, zero to 15. And this little machine I've built, which is going to get repeated, oh, you don't know how painful doing all these signs was, um, over and over again as we go through machines, is just so we can send different charges to this blue brick, the, the redstone dust on this blue brick, which is our input to the circuit that we're going to put here. So almost every machine is going to have one or, that we build is going to have one or more of these 15 long strings of levers, redstone dusts, and the convenient signs to remind us what each lever is doing, because if you don't have those, it's tedious to count every time. And this machine, depending on which lever we flick, will send a certain amount of current to this input spot on the blue brick. Then we'll have some circuit here. It's often gonna be much more complicated than just a comparator. This one, when I actually explain what it's doing, is just to show you what a, com a single comparator on its own does. This orange is then the output of the circuit, right? And, and in many cases further on, the circuit will be big and complicated and the blue and the orange will be much further separated. And then I've built these convenient displays, which basically consist of 15 different redstone lamps, okay? And I am not gonna go through all the explanation of why this works, but I've got this machine in the back that basically what it does is it, it takes this input, the output, whatever charge the redstone dust on the orange get, gets and lights up exactly that many lights. So if the charge that this orange bit gets is 15, all 15 lights will light up. If it's only two, then only these first two bottom lights will light up. If, if that's charged up to five, then we'll get a the first five lights will be charged up. So that's what this machine does, okay? Now let's, well, that's what all this does. So now let's see just to start off, cause we're gonna use these comparators a lot. Um, as I said, well, I'll get back to this. This comparator, here's one way we're gonna use it. 
Um, and for this usage, it actually doesn't matter which mode we have it in, because if we don't have inputs to the, on the sides, the two modes behave identically. It's only when they have supplementary inputs coming in on one or another sides that flipping that little switch there matters. So I'm going to leave it off when I'm using, and you'll see why in a moment, when I'm using it for this purpose. One thing that a comparator does is it preserves the current, right? So what if we wanted to, to have a long string of circuits, but we didn't want to lose power, lose voltage as we go from one spot to the next, right? Because remember, as I just explained, if we used redstone dust, each step we're going to lose, is going to go down in power, right? Well, the comparator preserves the power. Whatever the input is coming from the back, it'll give the same output here. Okay, so for example, if we flip eight, that means this patch of redstone dust is charged up to level eight, right? Because it was 15 way down there and each it lost a successive one in each, one, each step. And then the comparator passes that charge of eight onto this next redstone bit, which then goes into my light up machine. And lo and behold, I'll step back a little bit. We have exactly eight lights lit, right? So the comparator, if I don't have any inputs coming in on the sides, preserves the charge in a way that successive redstone dust doesn't. Now, one thing I should point out is redstone dust on its own is not a minus one operator because we don't lose any current on this bit of redstone dust if it's by itself, if it's between, say, two comparators. Redstone dust is sort of contextual, and you only have the minus one function if it's going from a patch of redstone dust to another patch of redstone dust, right? So you only lose charge in the transition from redstone to redstone. If it, say, if it alternated comparators and redstone, you would just have a constant charge all the way down, and that's what makes this bit work here. It's only when they're successive that you lose a bit of charge. Okay. So that is the one usage of a comparator. And in any machine, if you see a comparator where that light is not lit, that's all it's doing, is it's just carrying current in a way that preserves the value of the current. And you're going to see long strings of those in, in later machines where we want to carry a current over a particular patch of ground, and we don't want to lose any, any of the power, right? We want to keep, if it started at three, we want to keep it at three. Okay, next up we have the redstone torch. And we noted that the redstone torch was a kind of negation, but now that we're worrying about 16 values, we have to figure out what kind of negation it is, right? Because there are lots of different many-valued negations. And it turned out, turns out the redstone torch is in fact a strong negation. It is basically um, the... is zero operator. So notice, if I have no, none of the levers are flipped, so there's no input going in, which means, of course, the brick is charged, the redstone torch is active, and it sends an output. If we get, if, so if we input a value of zero, we get an output of 15. But if we input any positive, it doesn't have to be 15, any positive amount will turn the circuit off. All right, so if we have an input of one, we get an output of zero. We have an input of five, we get an output of zero. If we get an input of eight, we get an output of zero. The only time we get an output is we get a full charge of 15 if the input is zero. All right, we can go all the way down, flip the 15, we get a zero. Okay. By the way, you might notice there's a little bit of lag between me flipping this and the light's changing, and I'll talk about that later on. That'll come up in the it's definitely going to come up in the topics for further exploration section of this talk. So the redstone torch gives us a strong negation, right? Basically, a, it, it's the is zero operator, right? So it gives us a positive charge of 15 if the input is zero, and it gives us a zero output if we have any other input, any positive input. Okay, now let's talk about the comparator when we actually have inputs coming in in the side. So notice now we've got three of these inputs set up, three of these input chains, right? And we've got three blue bricks, one there, that's, that, that's the input from this chain, one there, that's the input from this chain, one there, that's the input from that chain. Now notice I've strung together some alternating redstone dust and comparators, but notice those lights are off. So these comparators here, 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 
here, here, here, and here are just there to preserve um, whatever value is coming out of the blue input box, right? One thing to notice, this could have been a comparator or redstone dust. It doesn't matter. This has to be redstone dust because comparators can't turn corners, right? So we do, but fortunately, it's just one patch of redstone dust, not two consecutively, so we don't lose any current, right? So whatever this value is will get preserved and sent into the side of the comparator. Whatever this value is here will get preserved and sent into this side. And then the middle input will get preserved by this and sent into the back. So what does the comparator do? Well, as I said, I'm a, there are two functions. I'm only going to use the function where the light is on, which is actually not the comparator function. Um, so let's see what it does. So let's say we send 10 in through the back. Okay. And notice that gives us, if we do nothing, it gives us 10, right? If we have zero inputs, because then they're irrelevant and it's still just working like a current preserver, right? If we have zero inputs here. But then let's go down here and flip five. So this side input is now sending a current of five into the side. So we got 10 coming in the back, five coming in the side. What do we get? We get an output of five. And the reason for that is the function that the comparator computes if this little light is on is the subtraction function, okay? It takes the main input from the back and subtracts the maximum. And, and you might wonder what would happen if we sent something over here? Well, if we say hit nine here, it'll just give us an output of one because what it does is it takes the main input and subtracts the larger of the two side inputs, right? So it's basically this input minus the maximum of these two inputs. Now in the actual, when I use these in actual machines, it's gonna be pretty, pretty conceptually simple because I'm never gonna have inputs coming into both sides. So it'll basically be a binary subtraction machine. So it will take the main input and subtract the side input. And of course, unsurprisingly, if the side input is bigger than the main input, so let's set this to 14, we just get zero, right? It, we, we can't get negative charges in the Minecraft circuitry. So the comparator is a subtraction function. Okay, let's turn these off. So far, so good. Now, we're not gonna use this, wait, okay. Um. Yeah, sorry, I was about to say something that comes later. Where am I? I have notes, so I just want to check the notes. And if people want to know what a comparator does in the other setting, I could come back to that in Q&A, but we're not going to use it, so I'm not going to worry about it now. Okay, now you'll, you'll remember we had a disjunction operator oh, way over there when we were doing sort of classical two-valued logic. So you might wonder what that operator does. Well, if we just build that same disjunction operator, but now with the three values, let's say we take nine, sorry, with the 16 valued cir circuits in mind and 10, right? You might expect it to give the maximum, right? So we've got 10 coming in on one disjunct. We've got nine coming in on the other. But notice, if we look up our tower, we only get an output of five. Why is that? Well, the pro problem is because that disjunction consisted of a bunch of redstone dust strung together, right? So this gets a charge of 10. This gets a charge of nine. But notice if this is nine, that's eight, that's seven, that's six. This is only getting a charge of five, right? Likewise, if that's 10, that's nine, that's eight, that's seven. This is only getting a charge of six. Right? So this does work as a maximum operator. It will pass on one less again, a charge of five here, which is why we get five lights. But if we want a disjunction operator that acts like a maximum operator, we're not going to be able to string, just do it by stringing all this redstone together because the redstone is causing us to lose current one level per step. But there's an easy way to fix that. And that's our next circuit which is a maximum disjunction. And if you've been following, you probably can suspect what we're gonna do here. We have our two big input sequences as usual, two inputs, the blue, two blue bricks. And what we're gonna do is just intersperse a bunch of comparators, right? 
and this will guarantee that we don't have that that current loss. So if we set that to 10 and we set this one to nine, then in fact, notice we get, it's easier to see from here, we get 10 lights lit up. We get exactly what we want, the maximum of nine and 10. And the idea is we've just stuck in comparators in that just notice the light's not on. It's just the preserve the current mode. So if that's 10, that's 10, that's 10, that's 10, right? Sorry, that was the nine one actually. But you know, if that's 10, that's 10, that's 10, that's 10, right? Then this will in fact take the maximum of these two values, pass, which is 10, pass it on to that comparator, which again is just preserving the current. So that gets 10. And then our light machine correctly lights up 10 lights. Okay, so that is our maximum operator. So a pretty natural disjunction for use in a 16 valued context, not the only disjunction one might be interested in, but a pretty natural one for what we're gonna do. Now I wanna talk about the switch that we haven't used, all right? Um, and we're never gonna use, we're not gonna use this in our proof of expressive completeness. The repeater is actually the other switch, looks kind of like a, a comparator, but has you know, the, the two knobs on it. Um, what we're actually going to do is show that at least one of the functions of the repeater is redundant. We're going to, after we prove functional completeness for the 16 valued logic, we're then going to use the repeater as an example of the sort of thing you can build. So let's look at what a repeater does. Um, again, the repeater has a number of different functions. I'm only going to worry about the unary function. So we're going to, the reason I put these side inputs is if we, if people are interested in the question in A, we might be able to come back and I could explain what a repeater does if you have inputs coming in from the side. I could also explain what happens if you change the setting of that switch, but none of that's relevant to what we're going to be doing today. So ignore the side inputs. We're only going to look at this, um, this um, main central input. And here's what a repeater does. If I send in an input of one, it outputs a full charge of 15. If I send in an input of four, it outputs a four, full charge of 15. If I send in an output of 10, it sends a full charge of 15. And of course, if I send in 15, it outputs 15. So what a repeater does basically is it's a current booster, right? Um, and actually when you're doing the, um, in, in most discussions of classical binary logic, um, when you're stringing together these the various or and 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 not gates to build your classical logic um, circuits, the stuff we talked about way over there. Actually, people use repeaters a lot because as we mentioned, right, redstone circuitry loses a, a level of charge. And we often, you know, so if you, if you had a string of them that was 15 or longer, it would just go down to zero. But if you occasionally intersperse a repeater, it'll boost uh, any positive charge back up to 15. So typically when people are doing classical logic, they use a lot of repeaters just to boost the on, you know, looking at it as just on or off to boost the signal strength so you can have arbitrarily long sort of wires or circuits without worrying about the, the fact that redstone loses a level of charge each step. So you just every, you know, to be safe, typically what people do is every, tw you know, you might do a string of 12, if you need a really long wire, you do a string of 12 redstone dust and then you'd throw in a repeater and it would boost it back up to 15. Strictly speaking, you only, you only need to do it every 15, but a lot of people do it a little, you know, just to save yourself mistakes, do it every 12 or so. So that's what a repeater does, um, is just boosts the signal. Okay, what else do we have? Um, well, we also need to worry about um, signal crossing with the 16 value. Because notice that the thing we built over in classical logic was just an over-under bridge with redstone. But of course, that redstone dust, you know, in sequences four or five long the way it was, is going to lose current. And we want to guarantee that we can cross circuits without losing and preserve the current. Um, and there's a way to do this, and what I'll show it to you here. So we've got our standard inputs. And then this goes, and, and by the way, there are weird, tricky aspects about when you're jumping levels going up or down, how stuff connects. I'm not going to go through all the details, but I just want to point out that the arrangement of comparators to, and dust in this sort of bridge setup is in fact important. Um, so here we have dust. That dust 
in, in addition to charging, say, things that might be next to it, that spot of dust there is actually charging the brick beneath it. Then we have a comparator that's actually taking the charge from the brick beneath the dust. Then there's dust. That dust could be a comparator. That's the one bit that doesn't matter. Then another comparator that's running straight in and charging this brick below the dust, which then charges the dust above it, which goes into our output machine. Similarly, for this direction, you know, we have the circuit come around. This comparator charges this brick, which charges the dust on top, which gets carried through the comparator so we don't lose any charge, which then charges the dust. This dust charges the brick underneath. Then the comparator takes the charge from the brick and then passes it on through a string of dust and comparators to that output. And in this way, we can send outputs crisscrossing. So let's say maybe pick 12 here and pick nine here. They can crisscross over and under each other. And notice this one, by the way, because it's crossing is the far output. And then lo and behold, we get 12. And this one, the nine, is the one that goes under and goes straight across. And lo and behold, we get nine, right? It's 15 tall minus the six dark ones is nine. I know you can't see that bottom one very well. Okay. So it's a little tricky and involves some subtle stuff about how Mindstone components connect together, but we can in fact cross circuits without losing any current um, or, or level of charge um, using this setup here. Okay, turn these off. Okay. Now, of course, we're, we're in a many-valued logic, so of course there are other kinds of negations we might want. One is a generalization of choice negation, right? And this sort of inverts values, so it would make 15, 0, it would make 0, 15, it would make 14, 1, 1, 14, make 13, 2, right? It just sort of flips the values, right? Just, um, and in fact, we can get that very easily just by using our subtraction function, right? So this torch which is always on, notice there are no, no circuits coming into that brick, feeds a value of 15 into the back of the comparator, notice that front knob is lit, so it's working as a subtraction machine. Then our input, whatever we choose, comes in up here, we subtract our input from 15, and then we just, what well, we had to do a little turn the corner, but then we feed it into our display. So notice if we've got nothing is on right now, an input of zero gives us an output of 15, right? And so it charged all the way up. An input of 15 gives us zero, right? An input of 14 gives us one. An input of 13 gives us two. An input of 12 gives us three and so on, right? An input of one down here gives us an output of 14. So that's a sort of generalized choice negation within the Minecraft circuitry. And also we can construct a weak negation, right? So remember that the redstone torch on its own was a strong negation, right? It only lit up if we had, if we had no charge at all, right? So it lit up on zero, didn't light up on anything else. Weak negation should light up on any charge other than 15, right? And in fact, this does, right? So let's turn it to one, it's still lit up, turn it to two, it's still lit up. I won't do all of them, obviously, but we'll turn it to nine. It's still lit up. Turn it to 14. It's still lit up. But lo and behold, exactly as we want, we turn it to 15 and we get no output, right? So we get a zero output on 15. And the trick for this, I will do a little flying for this one so it's easy to see, is we basically, what we've got here is we've got a copy of choice negation. So we subtract the input from 15. Then we have a strong negation, right? Just our negation that feeds into the brick that turns the torch on or off. And then we take the output of that and do, do our, cho our choice negation again, subtract it from um, 15. And that in fact gives us what we want. Um, there are other arrangements of the two previous negations that will work, but this is the one that works pretty nicely and is relatively elegant, right? So we, the, the choice negation, strong negation, choice negation gives us weak negation, okay? Finally, we're going to need a conjunction. 
but the conjunction we used in the classical logic case over there um, isn't going to work for the same reason that the or over there didn't work. Um, well, actually, it's not going to work for two reasons. One is the strings of redstone are going to cause a loss. But remember, the second thing is we used redstone torches for negations when we were doing classical logic. And that's okay. But if we actually want our conjunction to be a minimum function, we need to do something slightly more clever. And what we need to do is a De Morgan's construction on our OR, but instead of using the redstone torch negation, notice we're, subtra we're doing the choice negation here. So we subtract our input from 15. Here we subtract the other input from 15. Then we have our maximum machine, right? Then we subtract the result from 15, right? So it's a De Morgan's, but we're using the choice negations instead of strong or weak negation. We're using our, our subtract from 15 negations. And that, in fact, will give us our maximum operator. So let's just test it. I apologize. It's nighttime, so these are getting dark. Um, so that is, let's take eight there, and then we'll take 11 here. Sorry, it's a minimum operator. We have a maximum, right? Um, so 11 and eight, in fact, gives us eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But if we switch off 11 and instead turn on six, so now we've got six and eight, we get six, right? So it does in fact compute the minimum. Okay, so we've got a minimum operator for conjunction. We've got a, our maximum operator for disjunction. We've got negate various kinds of negations. So this was all sort of toolboxy, right? This was all sort of constructing a bunch of basic machines that are going to be useful in what we're building. Um, let me look at my notes to see if I missed anything I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, the only thing I wanted to talk about is if you look up online, especially YouTube videos, but other things that talk about the 16 values that are involved in redstone circuitry and... Um, how to take advantage of all 16 values and the subtlety that you can get there to build various machines that do various kinds of things. There's a bit of um, Minecraft terminology that will throw you off if you don't know about it. Mach circuitry that takes advantage of all 16 values is, is known within the Minecraft community as analog. People who build in Minecraft are fully aware that it's not analog, right? Um, that it's 16 values is, is not an analog system. Um, but it's just a term of art. It's a technical term in the Minecraft um, community. And to distinguish it from machines that built, that, like the stuff we talked about at the very beginning, that only care about whether a circuit is on or off, that doesn't care about the level from 0 to 15 of on values. Okay. Um, so this should go relatively quickly. I'll kind of fly through it. So here I have built an addition gate. Okay. And all it is... We've got our inputs. We take 15, we subtract the first input from that, send that over here, subtract the second input from the result from over here, and then take that output and subtract it from 15. And if you write that out, that is addition. That's how to define addition in terms of subtraction. So we've just got 15 minus input one, and we've got that minus input two, and then 15 minus the result of all of that. So that's our addition gate. Okay, I'm not gonna run it, trust me, it works. Um, also, just because this is often mathematically interesting to know how to do it, an addition gate easily gives us a successor gate, right? All I've done is I've got, this part's all identical to the addition gate, but instead of having a second input here, I've just built a really simple machine that, that, all, that just gives a constant input of one, right? Um, I could have just had a torch way down there and 14 bits of redstone dust, but this little thing is a bit more clever. And if you want, you can look at the world download and see and work through exactly how that works. Basically, the idea is this torch gives 15 there, 14 there. That's 15 minus 14, right? This is a subtraction, which gives an output of one. That's all that's going on. And then that torch gives a constant output of 15 to the back input. Okay. Um, the next thing we're gonna need for expressive completeness is Goldie, what are called Goldilocks gates. Um, these, by the way, it's a modification to the design, but the discussion is from a website called wonderhowto.com. And what a Goldilocks gate does is it 
fires off a positive, in fact, value 15 output, just in case the input is, the, is one desired value. So we already have a zero Goldilocks gate um, in hand because that's in fact what the redstone torch is. The red, this redstone torch will only light up this light if we have a zero input. If we have any other positive input, the light goes off. All right. That's just what a redstone torch does. So that's just repetition. But we need one of these for each value. So the one Goldilocks gate, here's what it does. Basically, it gets an input. Notice the light's going to turn on just in case that torch turns on. That torch can only turn on if neither of these circuits is powered. Okay? Now, both of those circuits will be off just in case, in this particular case, the input is one. Why? Because if the input is one, then it will reach to here, turn off that torch, hence deactivating that circuit. But if the input is one, that's half of what needs to be done. It needs to turn off that circuit without turning this one on. And if the value is one, then it'll go, this will be one, and that will be zero because of the loss of current in that step from redstone dust to redstone dust. However, if the current, if the current is, is less than one, that torch will not get turned off. If the current is greater than one, then the, the power will also make it to this brick via this path. Say it's two, that'll be two, that'll be one. That'll charge the brick, which will turn the torch off. So that light only turns on for an input of one, not for anything else. And we can build, I'm not, I did not build them, well, I did build them all later on in a big machine. We can build a two Goldilocks gate. All we need to do is the one Goldilocks gate and then put in an extra spot of redstone dust. So if that's charged to two, because that just is, um, protects the current, that's two which means that will be one, and then this will work exactly like the one Goldilocks gate, right? If you want a three Goldilocks gate, it's just three redstone dust here, right? You just move everything up a spot and have a string of three redstone. Four Goldilocks gate is four redstone here. Okay. Now, that's actually enough to build our um, expressive completeness result. Now, there are two ways we could do this. One is we could just take our 16 valued um, input and code it as an on off binary output and then use the result for classical logic, right? So for example, here is our binary encoder. So what it does is it takes a single 16 valued input from one of the 16 values and it outputs, the lights are over there, it's binary representation. So it gives four outputs. This works, this is where things actually got kind of significant. So let's do six, blah, 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 blah. I'll give you a variable view of what this is and how it works because it's slow. So basically what this does is it runs the input up the side. If the input is at least one, it'll make it to this little crossing here. And you'll notice there are four channels, one, two, three, four, although some don't get activated until way later. And it, and it gives the right, and this little, sorry, if it's at least one, it'll make it to here and it will activate the first light, the channel for the first light. However, if the input is at least two, it will do that, but then it will go down this channel and it will make the relevant required changes. What is, what is the change? Well, if this was already correct, set it up to correctly encode one, that meant the first one would be lit up, but the second, third, and fourth would not. So what this does is it lights up the second one and remember, I promised we were going to use XOR gates and uses an XOR gate so that if this is lit up, that it, then it, the new one won't be, right? So it's got the input from two and the input from one XOR gate. So if this says to light it up, that says not to. Then if the, and notice there are these little two redstone gaps here. If the charge is at least three, then it comes down here and does the required connections. It leaves the second value alone right, because we want to change one zero to one one, but uses another XOR gate to switch the value of the one value. Then if it's, if the charge, if the value we put in is at least four, it comes here, it activates the four, right, so the one, the third one gets activated, and then uses XOR gates to turn off 
the two's value and, and the one's value and all the way down. There's about two dozen XOR gates in this thing. But lo and behold, it's finally finished. We flipped the switch for six and we in fact got the binary numeral 011046. It is very, just see how slow it is. I'll, I'm not gonna run it. I'll just turn on 11. We'll you know, maybe come back and see that it works. It's super slow, but it works. Um, fortunately, we, we, a binary decoder is much easier because it's just an addition thing, right? So if we have a number in binary, that's the ones place, twos place, fours place, eight plates. Um, all we do for this is just string out enough redstone dust to turn this 15 input into an eight, this 15 input into a four, this 15 input into a two, this 15 input, if it's turned on, into a one, and then we have this, I've just strung together a bunch of addition gates. So that's pretty simple. So if we want to take six, we hit those, and lo and behold, we get six. Much quicker, much simpler. Kind of interesting to me why the encoder is so much, um, binary encoder is so much more complicated than the decoder. Now we can um, emulate our repeater. Remember I said this was gonna be the example, right? And remember the repeater takes any, if you input zero, it's zero. And we can see that, no lights are lit up over there but it takes any input and boosts it up to 15. So I'll say how this works. So this is basically our expressive completeness result right here. So we're pretty much done, I promise. Here's what it does. It takes our input and splits it into 16 copies, right? If this were a binary operator that we were trying to build, an arbitrary binary operation, we would need 16 squared. Right, we would need, basically we need a copy, we need a copy of the inputs, one copy of the inputs for each possible combination of inputs, All right? So here we have 16 possibilities, zero to 15. So we have 16 sort of circuits or channels. Each of these is then connected up to the relevant Goldilocks gate. Okay, and that's what those are there. So that's everything that happens up, you can see that faint yellow line where I put in a different kind of brick. All that's going on there is we have 16 copies of the input. We run each one through a Goldilocks gate, right? The, the zero Goldilocks gate, the one, the two, the three, the four. Notice only one of these is going to light up, right? In this case, we put in, what did we put in? Six? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. No, we put in nine, or it's set to nine. So the nine Goldilocks gate lights up. None of the others do. So that's sending a charge down there. Okay, so that's everything that happens is it just basically takes all the inputs and it's gonna light up the, the, the circuit that comes out of the Goldilocks gate a cor that corresponds to the input we're sending through. All the rest are dead. Then for each of these Goldilocks gates, we just attach a machine that will turn that 15 valued output that's coming from the Goldilocks gate into the appropriate input. Why are two Goldilocks gates lit up? Oh, I see, Never mind. Um, and that's pretty easy in this case because we just need to make sure that the zero value right, gets turned into a 15, sorry, it stays at zero, and all the others get boosted up to 15, but they're already at at 15. So we actually, for this particular case, didn't need to do anything because we're emulating the repeater. Um, then we just take the maximum of all these, right, which will either be zero because nothing's for most of them because the, those relevant circuits aren't activated, or for the one that is activated, it will be the appropriate output, which we see here is 15, right? So we get 15 coming out of here. So we hit nine, we get 15 coming out. Um, so that's basically the idea behind it. Now you'll remember I made a big deal over there of building a maximum machine. There's a step that's left out of this that would need to be carried out if we were doing say a binary function or a ternary function. There we would have, you know, if we did a two-place function, we'd have all these pairs of Goldilocks gates. We'd have one for zero, zero, then one for zero, one, then one for zero, two, dot, 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 then one for one, zero, one, 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 two, for all the different possible combinations of pairs of inputs. After the Goldilocks, all those Goldilocks gates, 
But before we actually get to the stage between the two yellow stripes where we fix the appropriate outputs to each one, we would need to take the minimum of the, the relevant pairs. Because if we, ha cause if, we, if we have pairs for a binary one, for many of those pairs, one of the Goldilocks circuits is going to light up, but not the other, right? But we only want the one where both light, lights up. Right, so that one will bo both will light up because those it's the one corresponding to the inputs we actually input. We want that, so we take the minimum of that, and that'll be fifteen. For any other ones, maybe both of the Goldilockses are not acti activated, or one is and one isn't. But if we take the minimum for those cases, we'll get a zero coming out, and then then we would string each the maximum the minimum for each pair onto the appropriate output, and that's what happens between the stripes. Okay. So that is expressive completeness. At least that's the recipe. And I've carried it out for the repeater. You could do it for any operation from n tuples of 16 values to a output of 16 value. Just write down your 16 valued truth table and you could follow this recipe. I know I'm running over time, so it has been a little rushed. One nice thing about this is it very much illustrates how the general algorithm you get for an expressive completeness result or a functional completeness result is far from the most efficient way to get that function, right? So here we have the efficient repeater, right? Turns out there's a much easier way to get the effective re repeater. You just string together two strong negations, right? Two of our little, you know, input brick torch devices, and that acts exactly like a repeater, right? If we put in an input of, say, four, we get an output of 15. If we put in an input of, say, eight, we still get an output of 15, right? But of course, this recipe over here works in general, right? It shows that in general, we can get everything. I'll make a quick um, comment. This was meant to be my memory device, right? 16 valued memory. And the idea is there's 16 switches and you would flip a switch and it would turn on the corresponding light. And then if you flip the switch off, that light would stay on until you flipped one of the other switches. Um, there is a slight but systematic bug in my design, which because it's got all these feedback loops, um, I didn't realize until I built the entire darn huge thing. Um, but the principle here is the same as the two-valued one. Each input is meant to send a signal to each of these lights here has a torch behind it. It sends a signal to every torch other than the one for its own light that will turn off all the other ones. But then each of these torches also has a circuit that sends a signal to all of the other torches but itself. So once these all get turned off, say if we flip this switch, these all get turned off, this is on, but then it set, it's because it's on, it's sending a signal to all of these that will continue to have them off. Even if you stop the input here, once it settles down in that feedback loop, it's stable. But then if we turned on another one, say we turned on two, that would turn off this torch, continue to guarantee all of these were off, but there would no longer be anything preventing this torch from turning back on. It would turn on, then it would send a signal that would continue to guarantee all the other torches were off. And that, hence that light would stay lit when you turned off the two, um, the switch for two, right? It would store that value. Right, and similarly for any of the 16. The problem is that I did not realize this until much later. Many of these crossings here, you'll notice a signal can go through here four ways. It can go from here to here, you know, straight up, straight across, up and across, or over and up. The problem is I only need three, I can only have three of these, those d directions. There sh it should not allow a signal to go up and over. Um, easy in principle to fix, although I got to fix it dozens and dozens of times. The problem is because that we would just what we would do is use our over under crossing, which would have a you know, over there, under there, and then I would have a little off ramp <coughs> from this signal to that, but not no similar off ramp that would go from up to over. The problem is the way I built it, that fix will not elegantly fit in the space that I've provided. Right? I need more space between these horizontal lines in order to do that with the over-under circuit design, at least we've been using up until now, these things. 
Um, so I'm going to have to rebuild this entire thing, spreading it out more. Um, you will notice, however, that as big as our binary encoder and decoder are, if we want to do 16 valued memory, this thing is so huge just to store one 16, value, 16 valued input that we might for memory just be better off encoding it in binary and then storing memory using four of our very simple little binary memory um, circuits instead of using this monster thing. That's probably still going to be more efficient anyway, which was part of why I was building this machine was just to show how inefficient it was. Um, but that is the talk that shows you what Minecraft can do with 16 values. Um, I've got some quick comments about further topics and then I will quit and we can go to question and answers. I know I've gone way over. We did start a couple minutes late. Um, so there are two kinds of questions here that are of interest. One are further questions you might just wonder about the logic of Minecraft, right? They're not gonna have huge philosophical import outside of playing the game. And a lot of these questions have to do with delay. So here's a very simple question you could ask. Um, so to ask this question, I'll get a little more specific about the um, delays. So redstone comparators, redstone repeaters, a lot of the redstone components have what's called a one redstone tick delay. A redstone tick is a tenth of a second, right? Now that seems like very little when we're looking at these very small circuits way over there in the distance. But by the time you get to the binary encoder, right, we had to wait a long time for all these computations to happen. And that isn't because the computations are taking power or anything. It's because of the delay built into these strings of, of um, comparators. Now, redstone dust does, in fact, um, transmit up to the speed of your computer, transmit a signal instantaneously. So if I'd wanted this not to be slightly as pretty, I could have alternated redstone dust and comparators. Because remember, if we alternate, every other one, we don't get the loss of, circ of current. Um, and it would have run a little faster, but still it would have been about, ha it would have been more than half the time of what I've got here. Um, so it would still be very, very slow. So there's an interesting question about what the, given an NRA 16 valued logical function, what is the lower bound on the speed of a, of a machine that we can build that computes that function? right? How quick can we do these for unary operators, binary operators, given the inherent delay? So there's this interesting practical question within Minecraft. It's kind of mathematically interesting, I think. Um, but there's also a much more sort of serious application, and this connects to some relatively recent work by Shramko and Wansing on 16-valued logic. And they have a paper, relatively well-known paper, called Some Useful 16-Valued Logic, How a Computer Network Should Think. Um, and they've got a book, which I've ordered, but I've not read the book. I have read the paper. And that logic could be implemented within Minecraft using Redstone. Now, it's going to be difficult to do elegantly and efficiently because the Redstone current, the 16 values, are sort of naturally thought of linearly from sort of zero is the lowest value to 15 is the highest value. Shramko and Wansing's applications and ideas depend on the 16 values being a trilattice, right? So there are, there are three different ways of ordering the values that form a lattice. So it's a very different kind of ordering. Now the expressive completeness result that I hopefully sketched enough for you to at least see roughly how it goes, shows that we can construct machines that behave like Shramko's truth ordering conjunctions and disjunctions or information ordering um, conjunctions and disjunctions but they're not going to be natural. They're not going to be anything like the minimum and maximum operators that we constructed over there, which were thinking of the values as linearly ordered from zero to 15, right? They're going to be very different sorts of operations. And we're going to have to try to figure out how to codify Shramko and Wansing's understandings of the 16 values in a natural way as numbers from zero to 15, for, you know. So there are a lot of questions